Okay. Praise God. Okay, so I've got a panel with me. There are five key elements we need to discuss. And those five elements are very essential for what we have to accomplish today. Then afterwards, I'll share the word. So I want you to pay attention. I want you to pay attention. Can I allow them to introduce themselves? Okay, so tell us your name. And tell us one thing about yourself that we may not know. We'll begin with my far right. In short, this is mic check. Thank you so much, Pastor. Good morning, City of the Lord Church. Good morning. Um, my name is Febi Joy Chisefu. I serve in the sports with some East of Zion. <laughs> Okay, one thing about yourself. I bake. <laughs> that is such a surprise, you know. We had no idea. Febi, do you write songs? Because you've got such a good voice. I have not attempted to write a song yet. Okay. Um, we haven't heard you sing in a while. Can, can we have another mic? Because uh, that one is not sound. It's sounding a bit muffled. Uh, just give me when I always just quick quick didn't do right give them a key yeah give, give her a key I hope you guys are ready to just I only want just one verse you don't remember the lyrics you will remember them yeah give her a key do you want to give her the intro or a key no the key I've got her unaware. <laughs> Should I give you a minute to compose yourself? Okay, let me give her a minute to compose herself as Nicholas prepares his song. So let's hear. <laughs> okay, let's hear from the gentleman at the far left. Uh, good morning, City of the Lord Church. Good morning. Good morning. I am. Um, I am Kuchin Vetsefo and I serve as a deacon and also I'm the vice head for the award winning media department. Um, one, one thing about me is I like learning about historical events. So I like doing research and also learning about various things that happened in and around the world. Can you give me an example of one thing you've learned about recently? Um, so recently, I learned about the, there were great floods which happened in 1931 in China, in Wuhan, and Wuhan. Oh, yeah, isn't that the same Again. place Again. where COVID? <laughs> Something is fishy. <laughs> okay, go on. Yeah, so um, they were really, really bad, and. Uh, about two million people lost their lives. Ish. Yeah, but uh, through uh, coordinations and helping each other out, they managed to pull through it. Okay. So, yeah. hey, okay. <laughs> Let's hear from the gentleman to my near right. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. Um, my name is Nicholas Swale. I'm privileged to serve as a minister and a member of Protocol. Tell us one thing about yourself. Um, I like reading books a lot. And I'm a published author of three. Okay. <laughs> What's, what are your titles? Um, Overcoming the Flesh, My Destiny, My Responsibility. Um, the second one is Seen Beyond, the third one is Seen Beyond Failure. Okay, what inspired Seeing Beyond Failure? Um, it's the, the fact that um, no one plans to fail, but we, time and again, we find ourselves failing on uh, so many things, and we, we really need to have an understanding of how to see beyond that failure. 
so that we just reposition ourselves to launch back. Okay, that sounds like interesting titles. I would like to take a look at them. Thank you, Pastor. We can give him a hand, please. If that one is muffled, you may need to switch. Uh, let's now hear from the lady to my near left. Uh, good morning, City of the Lord Church. Good morning. Uh, my name is Waliachumu Tambolela, and I'm privileged to serve as a minister and also the vice secretary for this branch. Praise the Lord. Okay. One thing about yourself. That people don't know. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm a network engineer. You should see the shock on people's faces right now. Like, what do you mean you're a network engineer? Okay, so most of us, like, we just know, oh, we have connectivity, but you don't really understand how that comes about, especially those of us that are working. You just call your IT to say we don't have network, we don't have connection, and sometimes all we know is just cables, but... What happens in those cables? Who determines how we are able to connect to Zanako, we are able to connect to this bank, we are able to connect to uh, Pakra, or all these systems? How are you able to access that? So we are the people that do the work. <laughs> you know, she's sounding like she's marketing, yeah. network engineering. I think, I think you're a marketer. Fabi, are you ready? In under a minute, give us that, and then... Uh, yeah, all the best. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> when I always didn't do even changed the lyrics but we didn't notice <laughs> wow you should have seen Dukon Shamaya smiling <laughs> okay don't be, so, don't be surprised if you sing that song at the end now I want us to look at five key elements of the Lord Jesus five key elements about the Lord Jesus so you can practically consider this sermon number one, and then sermon number two um, will come after. Now, there are five key elements about the Lord Jesus that are vital for every believer. And I want you to write them down. Deacon Kuchinthia, kindly give us the first one. And tell us a little bit about it all right thank you very much pastor and the first one is his birth to read the bible and even just sorry just before you go on everybody number two is his life so what was number one his birth number two yeah please go on yeah so when we get to read the bible and even just from the many sermons that we've been taught we get to see how Jesus Christ lived a purpose-filled life. We get to see how everything that he had to do from A to Z was to fulfill his purpose. You know, we also get to see how he lived a life, you know, full of compassion, full of love. He was a kind of uh, person, yeah, person, because he identified with humanity. Secondly, I would like to say... 
from everything that I have learned and read, Jesus Christ lived to give. So uh, let's go to the book of John 10.10. 10. I'll go uh -huh. ahead of media. I'll just read it very quickly. So the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So when I say he lived to give, we see how he effortlessly lived to give us life in this particular scripture. So, yeah. Can we live like Jesus did? Yes, we can. Pastor. To what extent? In your view? Like, sometimes I feel like we've only scratched the surface. Don't you think so? Well, the fact that he identified with humanity, meaning he lived a certain way that we lived. He was able to, uh, John 11.35 uh, tells us to say Jesus wept, meaning he felt sadness. He experienced temptations. So if he went um, in human form to live a certain way and experience these things, meaning for us, he came to die for us so we could experience a certain life that he wanted us to experience. Now, Fabi, you're getting me thinking. You know why you're getting me thinking? Because on my end, I can't imagine Jesus is on a donkey or on a horse and then his horse hits another horse and then Jesus is on the ground and the disciples are coming, Master, don't leave us. I don't know. I just feel like that ground would become a jumping castle if Jesus had to fall on it. <laughs> he walked on water it became solid ground so yeah it's possible so can we i, I don't think it's my point you know like whenever we're thinking of living like christ we think about the holiness side of it and that's important but can, can i talk to trees can i can i talk to water can i talk to baking ingredients <laughs> what do you think um, in his teachings, he, one of his teachings, um, he talked about and emphasized on the believer's authority. So this is something that even as a city of the Lord Church, we get to learn about, we are taught on the believer's authority. So there's literally nothing that a believer cannot experience, which Christ actually experienced here on earth. Amen. Somebody praise God for that. And that is why you find it interesting that what he identified as, he now identifies us as. For example, we sing about him, light of the world. And then afterwards he says, you are the light of the world. So sometimes you think, so like, who's the light of the world? <laughs> okay, let's have the third element. Can we give Mrs. Josepho a hand? <laughs> let's have the third element where we're going to have Mrs. Mbolela. Yes, our dear minister, what is the third element? Thank you, Pastor, sir. So the third element is his death. Everybody, what's the third element? His death. Number one was? His birth. Number two? His life. Number three? Okay, talk to us. Like, I mean, when Jesus came, he had an opportunity. I think there was a time they even just wanted to crown him king. I mean, there was an opportunity to just be king. Why, why the death? Like, that? he went through a lot. Why? Well, Pastor, sir, um, first of all, if you attended the sons and daughters uh, convocation, I think I attended. Yes. Uh -huh. So you taught us, um, that's one of the conferences I'll leave to remember. It was really amazing. And we saw how death came to reign from Adam. So we see from Genesis 2, verse 17, where God is telling Adam and Eve that they may eat of everything in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he told them to say, if they ate from that tree, they would die. And we also see that they eventually ate and their death came to reign. So now when death 
reigned and when death was given that power to reign, there was a demand for there was a righteous demand for justice, Pastor Sir. And we see how when God um, moved with his children, like every time they sinned, they had to make an atonement. They even had a certain day where they could atone for the whole nation. They would uh, bring burnt uh, offerings, animals and whatnot to atone for their sins. But Pastor Sir, none of that could fulfill the righteous demands for justice because we see even in Romans 6 verse 23 for the wages of sin is death pastor sir so because there was sin there death had to come in uh, the payment for that sin was death and all the animals that they could bring to atone. And remember, this was like year after year. But now we needed to be reconciled for good. There was separation. The death that started to reign, it wasn't just a physical death, but it was also a spiritual death where we were separated from God. Now, we could no longer have this fellowship that was initially intended. There was that separation. And all these animals could not satisfy that or fulfill that demand so there needed to be blood of somebody who was righteous pastor sir someone whose whose blood could fulfill that demand for the justice that was needed and in the whole world no one was found righteous no one was found worthy pastor sir except the son of God himself, and therefore his death, Pastor Sir, it meant that he became sin. So wait, he didn't just carry sin. No, Pastor. Because sometimes people think he was like carrying sin in a bucket. No, no. <laughs> Not he at became all. sin. He became sin, and the punishment for sin was death. So when he became that sin, mm -hmm. he had to die because that was the death sentence. How is that important for me? Pastor, sir, that is very important because when on the cross, when blood and water came out, first of all, we, we understand, like you taught us, when they would offer all these sacrifices, the blood, that was speaking, that was what, I'll just read from Leviticus, just so that we um, maybe follow and understand why that blood needed to be shed and why he couldn't just die in his sleep or any other death. Praise the Lord. Mm. And I'll read from Leviticus 17 verse 11. I'll go before media. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Blood needed to be shed, Pastor, sir, because that blood needed to atone our sins. And after that blood was shed, Pastor, sir, God saw that blood and he was satisfied because the righteous demands for justice were fulfilled. So in that death, Pastor Sir, that was my victory. So I don't have to go on the cross. Not at all, Pastor. Because Jesus went. He already did that. Wow, twice. can we give a clap off I mean, um, You've never heard of people celebrating someone's death. And yet in this case. <laughs> okay, so now Jesus didn't just die. We've got the fourth element. And perhaps Minister Nicholas, you can give that one to us. Thank you, Pastor Sir. Uh, the fourth one is his resurrection. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, what's the fourth one? So let's begin from the earlier one. The first one. He's number two. He's number three. He's number four. He's okay. Talk to us about the resurrection. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Sir. Um, let me begin by reading two passages of scriptures. The first one is First Peter 1 3. NOT, the Bible says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Praise the Lord. 
The second scripture is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. The Bible reads, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Praise the Lord. Pastor, from this passage of scriptures, um, I can boldly say uh, Christianity is the product of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are born again because Jesus is alive. The resurrection of Jesus validates the external life that we received. When Jesus said in John 3.16 that whoever believes in him should not perish. Pastor, that was validated when he resurrected. Uh, we see that in John 11, verse 25 and 26, when Jesus uh, went to raise uh, Lazarus, Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, this passage of scripture, or this is made possible because Jesus is alive. He resurrected. And so for us, pastor, uh, resurrection means new birth. Uh, Jesus the, the Apostle Paul in Romans 4, verse 25 says, he was raised for a justification. And justification means not guilty. So when Jesus resurrected, he declared us not guilty of all the sins that we committed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, you know something about that. From his death, it's like the death dealt with the sinner. But then the resurrection deals with the believer. Yes. The resurrection deals with the believer. And that's why, wow, what a life. What a life. Okay, we're done with those four. Should I give us the fifth one? Yes, yes. Hey. Okay, so I want to give us the fifth one. The fifth one is, can we just give a hand to Minister Nicholas? That was very well. It was very well explained. So the fifth one is his ascension. His ascension. Somebody say his ascension. his ascension. Say it again, his ascension. his ascension. So let's say them from the beginning. What's the first one? His birth. Second one? His life. Third one? His Fourth one? His and the fifth one? His now Acts chapter number one, verse nine says, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, no, by this point now they were used to this stuff, like, these two men stood next to him and they were not even like... I mean, if you've just seen a man go up in the air, like nothing shocks you anymore. Have you noticed that the disciples reached a point sometimes where they were not being shocked by certain things? Do you remember when Peter was in prison? And then Peter comes to knock at the door. And then they didn't want to open. They're like, ah, it's just his angel. <laughs> okay, so now, in verse 11, it says, Who also said, Men of Galilee... Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So meaning, uh, if we are progressing from here, the 60th one would be the works that he did, that is done after ascending, right? And then the seventh would be his return. But we're ending on the fifth his ascension 
Now, his ascension is very important for us. I want to give us another scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 17. We who are alive. Maybe let's start from verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So there will be a day. There will be a day. Now, maybe let me just explain this. When a person dies, um, death is really separation. So at that point, their spirit is separated from the body. So what we bury here on earth is a body, not a spirit. As a matter of fact, for a believer, when a believer dies, they go to heaven immediately. And you can prove it. Um, Stephen is being stoned. The guy is looking up and he sees the glory of God and the Lord Jesus standing next to him. Stephen didn't go rest in a grave. No. The Lord, of, the Lord Jesus who's supposed to be seated was standing. I don't, know, I don't know why. Maybe he was giving him a standing ovation. Maybe he was welcoming him. But the fact is Jesus was standing and Stephen saw him. The Apostle Paul at some point mentioned that he was in a dilemma. Whether to go and be with the Lord or to still be with the people. So there is an actual heaven. And then when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, that's crazy. That means there are bodies which would have been decomposed. <laughs> Some for thousands of years. The particles will find themselves together. Because remember, even their physical bodies will be risen. Unite with their spirit. And then it says we who are alive. So not everyone would be dead by the time he's coming. As a matter of fact, I'm planning to be on the we who are alive. <laughs> and then we will be caught up in the air. Yeah. We'll be caught up in the air. And then if we're doing our eschatology here, uh, that's just study of the end times. What's going to happen is that we're going to go. And then the earth will experience a great tribulation. This is the period where the Antichrist will reign. There will be a reign of an unholy trinity. The Antichrist, the beast, the prophet. The, is it? Yeah. And you can already see the signs of it. For example, you are aware that in that time there will be a mark. A mark of man. Which will be 666, right? Don't worry, no one can properly get it right now. Because that period is for the tribulation. And in that period, people won't be able to buy and sell without it. And you can tell the world is already prepared for it. You can't go to certain countries without certain passes. You can't, the societies are becoming cashless. The world is becoming digitalized. Now we can make use of it as much as possible because when we go, that would be now that would now be their enemy. Then there'll be that three and a half years which will first be good. Then there'll be those three and a half years where now the wars that John saw in Revelations will now start taking place, and people will be hammered. When Jesus talks about it, before that time, he says, "Look, that that period will be crazy. Two people will be in the field. One will go. The other one will remain." Now, if you find that you've remained. There is even advice that is given in the Bible. It says, run to the mountains. You know why I think people should run to the mountains in that period? There's, because that's where the network, at least, is, <laughs> is rough. Then, lo and behold, we're not going to stay in heaven forever, right? God is going to shift. God is going to shift. You know what's going to happen? God will shift. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, and God is shifting to the earth. Can we read the verse? Maybe we can end it. People are looking shocked. <laughs> Do you know that that's where we get our name from, as C-O-L? Revelation 21, verse 1. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. So it will come down from heaven. 
prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And then, I don't know whether in heaven they'll be shocked, but a loud voice will cry out from heaven, and what will the loud voice say? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. If you wanted to know, that's why I wrote a book called I Will Be Their God. So his ascension meant that he went to prepare a place for us. And heaven is a reality. Heaven is not a fantasy. It's a reality. And I will tell you something. As believers, as much as we should conquer the earth, we must never stop looking forward to heaven. Let me show you a verse that should determine what you should live by. So I like to sing songs about heaven. It reminds me. Because I'll tell you this. No matter how beautiful a car you have, how beautiful a house you have, how much money you have, it won't matter in heaven. It matters for the earth, but not in heaven. So you may want to be rich in heavenly treasures. You can also be rich in earthly ones as well. <laughs> now look at Psalm 84, verse 5. And after this, I'll sing a song about heaven, and then I'll go into the sermon. Okay, so so meaning I think let me have the pulpit and then let's clap for my <laughs> and then uh, suppose you're going to sing it with me, right? So meaning as I'm reading it you start walking slowly to the stage behind me yeah. Let's read it. Psalm 84, verse 5. Praise God. His ascension. Can we mention them again? What's the first one? Second? Third? Fourth? Fifth? Now verse 5 says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. Somebody say, My heart is on a pilgrimage. Now a pilgrimage is simply a journey. And then it says, As they pass through the valley of Bacha. Now the word Bacha there means weeping. So you guys know the earth is in a lot of weeping, right? But then these guys whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage, they are set on a journey. When they pass through the valley of Baca, what happens is they make it a spring of life. So we are not just seated waiting for heaven. We are doing something about the earth. Any place that we pass through, we are making a difference to make it a spring of, of life. And then the rain also covers it with pools. Next verse. They go from strength to strength. And then it says, each one appears before God in Zion. So imagine these guys. Their heart is on a pilgrimage. Their, their aim is to one day just boom, they've appeared before God. But on the way there, they pass through the valley of weeping. And they make it a spring of life. And eventually they just appear before God in Zion. That's you. Praise God. Every eye closed. But just gonna sing him of heaven. Mm. We can't wait to see you. We can't wait to see you. Hey. How I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets 
to look upon the one who died to save me and walk with him through all eternity there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and every prayer we breathe by revelation those songs of faith we sang to doubt and fear and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and on that day we join the resurrection we'll stand beside our heroes of our faith then with one voice a thousand generations we'll sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day and on that day Join the resurrection. We'll stand beside the heroes of our feet, and with one voice, a thousand generations hey, will sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Forever he shall reign So let him be today We'll shout the hymn of heaven With angels and the saints We'll raise a mighty God who gave us life beyond this age. Holy, holy is the Lord. So let it be today. We'll shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We'll raise a mighty Glory to our God Who gave us life beyond this day Holy, holy is the Lord So let it be today We shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints who raise a mighty wrong glory to our God 
who gave us life beyond this age. Holy is the Lord. If you've been forgiven, been forgiven, if you've been redeemed, you sing the song of danger to the land. And if you walk in freedom, Just the voices, everybody. And the angels cry. Holy. Oh, creation cries. Holy. You are lifted high. To the King of Kings, Holy. you will always be. Holy, holy forever. Now, in a minute, I want you to pray for anyone you know who's backslidden by name. I seek grace for them to come back to the faith. Anyone who's backslidden, pray for them. I seek grace for them to come back.
you, Jesus. Praise God. Please take your seats. Now, are you excited that Jesus is risen? We declare the resurrection power upon any situation that looks bleak, any situation that looks dead. I declare resurrection power now in Jesus' name. I want you to take me very, how can I put it? I know you always take me seriously, but today there's a way I want you to hear me. Um, if at some point you find that you're struggling to write notes just put the notebook aside and listen and ensure that unless I tell you to Kindly have zero discussions with your neighbor. Don't allow yourself to come to a place of judgment. Like you don't disturb in the house of God. I would also kindly request that no one moves as I teach. Okay. Are we okay with that? Okay. So you can say hi to your neighbor, greet them, find out how they are doing. So that during the sermon, you have no reason. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, we're all good. Praise, you managed to hear me from the drums? Okay. I want us to talk about the last 24 hours of Jesus' life on earth. And we'll see how many key elements we can touch. They're about, you don't know how many they are? If we were to follow it accurately, we can find about a hundred key elements. So it's literally one of those sermons where if I wanted, I could go point number 52, point number 70. And so uh, um, let's see how many we can touch. Maybe 15, maybe 200. We'll see. So the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. So let me allow you a part so that those who haven't finished their talk time can finish it in advance. Perhaps you can tell your neighbor what you remember about the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. I'm giving you an opportunity to settle, to put your notebook in order. Jesus climbed the hill to the garden still to the place only he could go. Try right another words. Love and a prayer to get there. Are we ready? Okay, we're not starting from Gethsemane. Let's start from a week before. Now, I will give you some very interesting... Um, media, just go turn off my laptop. It's probably my laptop. 
No, it's not. But just turn off my laptop just in case. Okay, so let's start from like a week or so before. Let's start from Palm Sunday. Somewhere there, right? Now, for some of them, I'll be quoting the verses. If I don't quote the verse, uh, maybe I can tell you in advance what I'm quoting, right? I'm quoting Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you've been for sons and daughters convocation, you know what I'm talking about. Because it's, it's very difficult to isolate them. So what, like my study is like uh, a conglomeration of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Jesus arrives in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. So it was a festive period. It was a festive period. And Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. And there were many people there. Because that period was a period when people would celebrate the Passover. And Jesus decided to arrive in style. Okay? He sent them to go and collect a donkey. He told someone saying, hey, you find a donkey tied? Tell the owner of the donkey the Lord needs it. Okay? And the donkey came. And now, if a donkey can be needed by God, how much more you? Okay, so a donkey comes and Jesus is now on a donkey. And you know, Jesus has got a thing for those kinds of animals because even coming back, he's going to come from like, you know, there'll be a horse and all that kind of stuff. So Jesus arrives on a donkey and maybe we can look at Matthew 21 verse 8. It says, a great multitude spread their clothes on the road and others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Maybe you understand why some churches would do like a Palm Sunday, right? Yeah, where they get branches. I'm not sure if they also spread their clothes on the road, but usually they get branches. So what would happen back in the day is if a king or a prince or a noble man went to fight on behalf of the country. And then they've won the battle. When he comes back, that's the way the people would receive him as a show of respect. So it would be like, can you imagine, like, let's say Alexander the Great. Oh, can you imagine Alexander the Great has managed to conquer Romania? He's on his way back. So all the people would be coming out like, this is the guy who keeps us safe. He's the reason we've got water. He's the reason we've got food. He's the reason our enemies don't trample over us. So when he would come, when they would all like come do their clothes. It's like, I think you've seen that even in our culture, right? Where someone is walking, you go do your chitenge and that. So it's a, sh it's a sign of respect. So I want you to imagine Jesus is coming and people are in shock because all the women, um, I've got a feeling there are a lot of women who are doing that. <laughs> you, know, you, you know women are very good at celebrating, right? When David killed Goliath, the men kept quiet. I think they were jealous. Then the women started. So has killed his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. <laughs> and so, you know, the, bah, bah, and he's coming in. He's on a donkey. And I think that day Jesus was like, I see you. Hey, the guy I healed. Ah, you, what do you mean? So, we tell if we know. And Jesus is coming back. And the interesting thing is that about a week or so before he died, this was like Jesus was the most popular man in Jerusalem. So we can say this was his ministry at its peak. To, receive, to be received in Jerusalem like that. Look at verse 9. It says the multitudes, and you, you need to understand this to see how much the crucifixion also hurt emotionally. Because look, he's come back, and the multitudes, these are not different people. They're the same ones we'll find later. It says the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, 
Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. By saying the son of David, they were saying this is the Messiah. Because the prophecy was that it would be the son of David who would be the Messiah. Let's continue. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Let's go on. So the multitude said, This is Jesus. The revelation was lower. The prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. But I want you to understand that Jesus shook the city just by coming. Imagine he came and the whole city was shaken. So, this was the peak of his ministry. From here, he did a few things. He went to the temple. He whipped people. Then me, I just give you one simple rebuke. No, church head. One simple rebuke. Jesus hurt them physically. <laughs> no, as time went by, I discovered I have no... I don't know. If there's something I don't feel bad for, it's rebuking. I have no challenge doing it. Not even one bit. There's someone who mentioned a statement that really changed my life. There was a time I was rebuking someone and they say crying and I was wondering whether to feel bad about it. Then I remembered the statement and decided to wait for them to finish. Then I continued. <laughs> Do you know the statement they made? They said, oh, but rebuking with love, of course, right? The statement they made was, it is not evil for a surgeon to cut part of your flesh if the aim is to remove a tumor. When you were younger, did you ever have a boil? Did you ever go through the doctor of home where they say, okay, your, your sister, mugwile nuku, uyuwina nuku. At that point, it's not really about whether you scream or not, right? It's the fact that it needs to come out. Afterwards, they'll tell you, no, ash, 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 ash. <laughs> but you should love correction. It helps. It grows you. That's how we grow. So the multitude said, this is Jesus the prophet. Then, yeah, Like I said, he went, he did one or two things in the temple. And then Jesus was lodging. He went to lodge in Bethany. Right? So... They had prepared where he would be. Maybe there were some people preparing breakfast, lunch. And then it's at that lodging place where that woman came and, you know, the costly perfume. And you know what's interesting is sometimes you hear people saying stuff like, um, what you give, you know, is not important. And it should always be secret. Jesus literally said, this woman, wherever this gospel is preached, what she's done will be mentioned. So she poured out costly perfume on him. And he said, she's preparing me for my burial. And I can imagine the disciples just like, this man, the way he likes to talk sometimes, don't be negative. <laughs> Speak positively. And in that period, one of the twelve called Judas. Remember, Judas, the signs were there. When the woman brought the perfume for Jesus, Judas was upset. She's, Judas was like, why didn't we just put it in the treasury and give to the poor? Some of the people who say certain things, they've got their own agendas. And the Bible says because he used to collect, he used to help himself <laughs> from the treasury. That's what the Bible says. So that's what happens, right? And then Judas, the signs were showing. And then eventually, something happened to Judas. And he went far. He decided to go to the chief priests. That's Matthew 26, verse 14. 
by this stage, the chief priests don't like Jesus, okay? Except they do want to grab him in front of the people because they said there would be a riot because he was very popular at that point. Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests uh -huh, and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Now, I want you to understand that this was not a lot of money. Sometimes we think Judas was going to become extremely wealthy. Let me show you the two other places 30 pieces of silver is mentioned in the Bible. Exodus. It was not a lot of money. As a matter of fact, it was an insult to Jesus for him to be sold for 30 pieces. He should have asked for more money. No, Judas should have asked for more. Look at this. <laughs> Exodus 21 verse 32. If an ox gores a male or female servant, he shall give their master 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. In short, 30 pieces was what a servant was worth. It was what a servant was worth. So it, this was what you pay if your ox accidentally killed a servant. You get 30 pieces. And to be fair, the servants were not necessarily treated well. We also see this from the book of Zechariah. Zechariah prophetically became a shepherd, right? Uh, guys, are, are we reading the Bible? <laughs> You've read the book of Zechariah before, right? Some of you have said no. You've seen that verse, uh, or that song you like, not by might. Not by power. Where do you think he comes from? They, come on, guys. You need to know this stuff. <laughs> okay, so Zechariah chapter number 11, verse 12. So Zechariah works as a shepherd, right? And then in 11, verse 12. Then I said to them, if it's agreeable to you, give me my wages. And if not, refrain. So they weighed out my wages for 30 pieces of silver. Then now, look at the next verse. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. It's like, <laughs> I don't know how I can put it. It's like, you see a bit of sarcasm in this verse because they are paid 30 pieces of silver and if you had to read earlier, the work that he had done was probably worth more than that. So the Lord tells him, just throw it to the potter. That, that princely price that they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. What did he do with the money? Threw it. Where? Into the house of the Lord for the potter. And then what was done? Let's look at something. Matthew 27 verse 3. So how much did Judas get? 30 pieces of silver. Then Matthew 27, 3, then we'll go back. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. And what did he do? Next verse. Saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Next verse. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and hanged himself. What did he do with the money? He threw it. Where did he throw it? In the temple. So Zechariah was a prophecy of what would happen with Judas. And then they got that money. When he threw it in the temple, now, let's just remember, Zechariah was told to give it to the porter. Judas threw it in the temple. Look at the next verse. But the chief priests took the silver and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. So they knew. Next verse. 
And they consulted together and brought with them and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. So where did the money end up going? Into a potter's field. So the Bible is full of, like there are a lot of repetitions and codes. Can we continue from there? You guys are looking at me. Like, let's go on. Okay, so Judas agrees to betray him. We've gone back to Matthew um, 21. And then, no, actually, that's 26. From here now, let's go to the events. Jesus then tells his disciples to go prepare the Passover. And at the Passover, he has supper with them. And the first thing he did with the disciples is he washed their feet. Now, I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that in that time, when they would meet for the Passover, the first thing that would happen is that feet would be washed. However, it was the lowest person who was supposed to wash everyone else's feet. I want you to understand that they were living in a desert and they had no cars. There is a very high chance their feet used to smell. These guys could walk long distances. So if you are a servant, now imagine the dust that's on people's feet. So if you are a servant and you are the lowest of the servants, your role was to wash everybody else's feet. So now imagine the shock on the disciples when they reach and then Jesus goes to get the bucket and he starts washing everyone's feet. And then some of them probably he had to get a stone like, you know, Napo And then he found someone was in the wrong socks. Ah, Paso, if were to wash people, <laughs> you'll be amazed. You find, <laughs> if it's gentlemen, you'll find the same pair of stockings from last year in February. <laughs> and all of them with holes. So Jesus begins to wash their feet and they're in shock. Do you now understand Peter's reaction? Peter was like, no, you're not washing my feet. And then Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in my kingdom. Peter says, don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands, wash my face. <laughs> Peter is actually my favorite person. <laughs> the guy was, what, what word can we use to describe him? Guys, what word can you use to describe him? Passionate, zealous. Okay. <laughs> but sometimes a bit obnoxious, right? <laughs> okay. Let's continue. Then, at the dinner, Jesus begins prophesying. Now, he wasn't prophesying in codes. They are seated, and he says, Okay, so one of you will betray me. And then there's always that, I think it was John. Yeah, they told John. Because John was like the last born. Ask him who. But John, I phone said, um, Jesus. <laughs> because you can find they had their suspicions. Maybe they were suspecting Thomas. Or Bartholomew. Guys, you know Bartholomew. <laughs> can you turn to your neighbor and say, name the 12 disciples. One, two, three, Go. Where has your neighbor reached? I hear someone has said Matthew, Mark, Luke. Mark and Luke. Someone even said Acts. Oh, guys, we are going serious. <laughs> Can I tell you? Guys, can, can, can I tell you the guy I feel pity for? The guy I feel pity for is the other Judas. Because there's Judas Iscariot, and then there's the other Judas. So now, like in heaven, when being introduced, hi guys, meet one of the disciples, Judas. The guy has asked me, guys, I'm not the one. <laughs> I 
I'm sure he will go to his parents and say, why did you name me Judas? Okay, guys, let's continue. So now, um, Jesus begins to prophesy and then when he is asked who, he says, the one who dips the hand, like we dipped at the same time. That's the one. And if you are to read in their culture, if you like share food with someone like that, then you consider them very close and intimate. Also, wherever you give money, the Bible says where the heart, <laughs> where the treasure is, the heart is also. And another interesting fact is Jesus washed Judas' feet. Even Judas' feet were washed by Jesus. That's deep. So now, Judas stands up and leaves. And as he left, the Bible says Satan entered him. Now, I wanted to tell you something. There are people who've always, like, have you ever heard people say, it wasn't me, it was the devil? No, no, no. Let me explain. Satan needed something to cooperate with. He, Satan just came to exaggerate what was there. It was already there. There is no behavioral witchcraft that works without a person's cooperation. So you find you're cheating on your spouse and you're saying, they gave me mazoi. First, how did you find yourself drinking it? But before we go to how you found yourself drinking it, most likely you're already having an affair and that stuff just made you addicted. That's how it is. Satan, and he, was already, he was already a problem by the time Satan was entering him. It's a teaching I'll do soon. I'll tell you, sometimes, you know why the renewing of the mind is very important? Because sometimes some people have interacted with the demon so much that they don't need the demon to do certain things. So you can cast out the demon and it is as though it never left. Because they can mimic it. One time, you know what, let's just continue. One time, there's this kid who was brought home. Uh, she was 16. And she goes like, when I go to a nightclub, there's just something that comes over me, then I'll talk and dance a certain way, and all the men will just follow me. Laid hands. The demon manifested doing the exact same thing. Singing like a certain uh, famous... Um, rapper in the US who's seen a lot as a sexual object and presents herself as such. And that's a song someone listens to the whole night. <laughs> Some songs have been written by demons. Like, purely, they sat down, the person, the demon, the devil, the antichrist, and the beast. <laughs> and they said, what song can we write today? Okay, let's just make sure there are a thousand insults in the song. And let's just talk like this. And then let's sing like this. And then let's promote it like this. Yeah. And don't worry, even the Christians will listen to it because people preach grace. I've seen some people at the door. I think there's space aside. Ashes, you can help. So Jesus does that. He, they also sang a hymn together. That's the one thing I would like to know. What hymn did they sing together? Uh, is there anyone else saying they would like to know the hymn they sang? They sang a hymn and he also predicted that Peter would deny him. Peter refused. Jesus thought, you are going to deny me. Ine. Peter was like, even if they kill you, I am dying with you. Jesus said, Peter, you will deny me. Peter said, me. What is your name? Simon Peter. The one who even prophesied that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Lelo, what I will deny you. No. Jesus says, you are going to deny me before the crook crows. You will deny me three times. Okay. Time goes on. And they now go to get money. And now, um, let me mention this. Now, 
if you don't want to get it as this, it's still okay. But it may help you, especially if you sometimes help people with apologetics. Uh, now, I, I don't believe Jesus was crucified on a Friday. No, I don't. But I, I, I don't talk a lot about it because I don't want them to get the holiday from us. And I'll be honest with you, like this is just me as Fred. I was telling my wife this morning that it baffles me. Those are the words I used, right? I said it baffles me that any theologian can think Jesus was crucified on a Friday. Before even going into the details, three days, three nights, and he was raised on the first day of the week. It's not, that's where, I'm saying this because you know some people mock our faith saying, it's not possible because if he died on a Friday at 15 hours and resurrected on a Sunday, then he wasn't in the grave three days and three nights, so the prophecy didn't come to pass. So it was three days, three nights. Now the reason why most people believe Friday is because he died before the Sabbath. But when you read from the book of John, and he resurrected after the Sabbath. But when you read from the book of John, you realize that it wasn't just any Sabbath. It was the high Sabbath. Why are you looking at me like... Can I just show you the verse? Alright guys, I usually serve such for the sons and daughters convocation. But I think someone is hungry. John 19.31 will show you. It was a high Sabbath. Should I explain what a high Sabbath is? So, therefore, because it was preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. Do you have the Amplified? Do we have it? Okay. Is it loading? Now, since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from hanging on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a very solemn and important one. Other versions would tell you it was a special Sabbath. Remember that Sabbath that would come every seven years. So it's like, let's say Christmas. Is Christmas, let's say Christmas is on the 25th. Christmas is not restricted to being on a Sunday. Whether Christmas catches you on a Wednesday, you still call it Christmas. Whether it catches you on a Tuesday, you call it Christmas. So from my understanding, this special Sabbath should have caught them somewhere on a Wednesday or on a Thursday. That is why after three days and three nights, he was raised again after the Sabbath. Which Sabbath? The Saturday. Because he rose on a Sunday. Selah. <laughs> I'm messing up your theology. Okay, but count three. Friday, you died 15. You wake up Sunday, come at four. <laughs> How many days and nights is that? That's one. <laughs> so Jesus said, just as Jonah was in the belly for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be. Three days, three nights. But the good thing is, no one will be blocked from entering heaven because they thought it was Friday. No one. <laughs> so, not in Capes, imagine for Facebook, Lelo. The problem, some of you don't know. Eh? Don't you know? <laughs> okay, so for those who are just joining us, we're looking at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, and we've reached the part where they were in Gethsemane. They sang, no, they were not in Gethsemane. They sang a hymn, and then they went to the Mountain of Olives. And then he told them, I think there, that's why he told them, some of you will be made to stumble because of me. Peter said, not me. Shan, shan, uko. Peter said, even if I'm to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then, another thing I should just mention before we go to Gethsemane is that at the supper, Jesus instituted communion. He instituted communion. Now, he said something interesting at the communion. By the way, it's not just communion that they ate. They actually ate supper. The wine was after. Now, Jesus said something interesting. With the bread, he said, this is my flesh which is broken for you. Eat. Would you have eaten? <laughs> and then he pours the wine. Elonish, you, you, you've missed your grape juice. And the like. 
And then he says, this is my blood. And then he didn't just say, this is my blood. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. That shows you that the New Testament, actually, <laughs> it's interesting that the blood contained the New Testament. And for a lot of what we read in the earlier Gospels, they were still functioning in the Old Testament until Jesus instituted the New Testament. So he says, this is my new covenant. So there was a new covenant different from the covenant given to Moses. And it was instituted through the blood. So he instituted the Lord's Supper. They went to Gethsemane. And in Gethsemane, Jesus told them, sit here. Let me go pray over there. And if you remember, even in Gethsemane, he separated the disciples from the three. I'm not sure whether these three were his favorite or they were the ones he trusted the most or they were the ones who, I'm not sure, but he used to separate them a lot. And then Jesus, when you read verse 38, it says, 37, 37 he began to be sorrowful and deeply depressed, distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. And Jesus wanted people to pray with him. The son of God wanted prayers. And so at this point, Jesus, and I want you to hear me well, experienced a high level of mental anguish. In short, the highest level of depression you can think of the highest level of anxiety you can think of, the highest level of all those things you can think of, Jesus actually experienced it in this moment. That's why his sweat became like drops of blood. As a matter of fact, some studies have suggested that there is a condition where you are so highly stressed that you begin to sweat blood. And it's interesting that Luke is the one who mentioned that and he was a physician. Maybe he's the only one who understood that condition. So his sweat becomes like drops of blood and he's in such mental anguish. And I want you to picture this for a moment. Because you know, it shouldn't always be about us. Now think about him. Because Jesus wasn't just this character that's in a story. It's not a movie. He's seated, standing or kneeling or down or I don't know. And he's experiencing this huge mental anguish. And I would think maybe he was thinking about the pain that the nails would cause on his hands or the pain that the nails would cause on his feet. But somehow I feel like that wasn't what he was dreading. When you read Hebrews 5 verse 7, the Bible says about Jesus, it says, who in the days of his flesh, amplified, in the days of his flesh made definite special prayers and petitions to him who was able to save him. And he was heard because of his godly fear. Now we're reading the brackets in the Amplified. Meaning his piety in that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father. Meaning for Jesus, the only way to scare him was to tell him that one day there will be a moment where you and the Father will be separated. For him, that was a horror movie that him and the father would be separated. Like, like um, I'm sure he was saying, what will I be if you take the Holy Ghost? Like, there was going to be a separation between him and the father. And that's what bothered him the most. There was going to be a separation. Can we continue from there? Not all of you said yes. I said, can we continue from there? Yes, Pastor. And from there he prays and he says, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but yours. So this happens, and as it does, he comes back and it, he finds them sleeping. And then he says, anyways, spirit is willing, flesh is weak. And at that point, Judas comes with the rest of the Jews and chief priests. And Judas reaches 
and he goes to give Jesus a kiss on the cheek. And they came with swords and with pangas. The priests came like junkies for Jesus. And then Jesus says, you guys used to see me all the time. If you wanted to arrest me, you could have just come. You could have just summoned me. And he says, anyways, it's now your time and the power of darkness. That means those guys were not alone. That's the day all the devils came. That's the day, I mean, for Satan to literally possess someone, it means that Satan in his kingdom, they had been planning, we need to get rid of the second Adam like we did the first. We tried with the temptations. We tried with Peter discouraging him. But now let's just kill him. So, because they didn't know that by killing, they were helping. If you read in 1 Corinthians 2, they didn't know. So they sat and they filled, like every demon you've ever heard of was probably with those people that day. All the principalities gathered. All the powers, mights, dominions, thrones, they all gathered that day. So it, people were seeing people. And yet what was there were devils. Devils, one for each person. <laughs> one to whisper to each, everyone shout Barabbas. Like devils and devils and devils, multitude of devils that day. And then Peter got a sword and he said, let me show him. That means I won't betray him. And he sliced the ear of one guy. Trivia question, what was his name? Come on, guys, Maukas. Mau. <laughs> he slices the ear of Maukas, and then Jesus, a little bit that shocks me. At that point, I, I, I really think this, the signs were there. He just gets the ear, puts it back. That's one of the craziest miracles I've ever heard of. He got it, put it back, and the guy after the ear comes out, cha. <laughs> and when you read from John's gospel they asked saying we are looking for Jesus of Nazareth and he replied I am he it says they fell they, <laughs> as in they all fell boom, boom. and guess what they did they got up and continued hey, I want you to understand it wasn't like orderly it was mob justice Disciples ran. Gone. How do you say it in colloquial? They dipped. <laughs> People began to remember their homes, their boats, as in they ran. How can you explain how within three days to a week, most of them already had their businesses back? <laughs> They then went back to <laughs> those same people who he told to leave. They went back to fishing. Anyway, to be fair, Jesus had warned them. Yeah. So the, the disciples dip, but then Peter and I think John follow from a distance. And then Jesus submitted to the arrest while the disciples ran away. For those who are wondering what, what verse, we're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then Jesus, if you read from John, was first taken to the house of Annas, where he's interrogated and abused. And then from there, we see him being brought to Caiaphas, who was the sitting high priest. Strangely, there were two high priests at that time. So, but Caiaphas was the sitting high priest. So in short, he was supposed to be the most holy man and a strange thing happened. Guys, can, I, can we read these things together? It's a strange thing that happened. Verse 65 of 26 of Matthew. Here's what the, strange, the, the, the high priest did. The high priest, when he heard Jesus say he was the son of God, tore his clothes. Now, back in the day, When people had a funeral or something sad, they would tear their clothes. So it was expected, for example, that if, let's say, a parent lost their child, to show that they are really grieving, they should tear their clothes. However, 
Do you know that it was not allowed for a high priest to tear their clothes, no matter the circumstance? Can I show you the verse? The yeses are reducing. I said, can I show you the verse? Exodus 28, verse 31 to 32. It says, you shall make a robe of the effort or of blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall have a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. And when you keep on reading on the robe of the high priest, it was not supposed to tear. Because the moment the high priest tears his robe, it meant that my authority has finished. My powers have finished. Do you remember that Aaron was the high priest? Okay, can you guys follow me on this one? Do you remember when Aaron was a high priest and then him and Miriam gossiped about Moses? Do you remember that the leprosy never came to Aaron, it came to Miriam? You know why? How can the high priest have leprosy? Then when Aaron was about to die, God told Moses, go tell him to remove his robe. The moment he removed it, he died. So there was a robe of protection because he was a high priest. So the moment Caiaphas tears his robe, what he doesn't know is that he's prophesying that I'm no longer the high priest now. And then, guess what he does? Caiaphas makes another mistake, a glorious one. He actually prophesied. He said, it is better one man dies than a whole nation. So as high priest, he's now given permission for one man to die in, on behalf of the entire nation. He doesn't know that. So he tears his robe. And in heaven they are ticking. Okay, he's now the high priest. And then... <laughs> The priests, the elders, the scribes, the officers, they abused Jesus. And I think somewhere around this point, Peter had now denied Jesus a second time, and then he denied him the third time. Now, the way he denied him the third time was bad. Can I show you? Verse 73 to 74. As in the first time, there was a bit of a, okay, I don't know him. The second time, e imwe. I also don't know him. Sin muziva. The third time was worse. Matthew 26, verse 70. For those of you who like reading one chapter a day, I pray your Bible app gives you Matthew 26. And then the next day, Psalm 119. So Matthew 26, verse 73. It says, a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Next verse. Then he began to curse and swear. In case you didn't know, that's how far Peter reached. As in Matthew couldn't even write it. Because his words now became and then the moment he finished right on cue Jesus looked. <laughs> I, I don't know who I feel bad for more. Jesus there or Peter. Can you imagine the feeling on Peter's end? Jesus looked and said that was it. And Peter went and wept bitterly. He remembered the words of Jesus. No, actually, when he did it, a rooster crowed. <laughs> and I think other, trans other books tell us Jesus looked at him. He went out and he wept bitterly. Okay, let's read a few more before 12. Then the priests send him to the Roman prefect. Prefect is not just like in high school. <laughs> Pilate was called a prefect. So maybe I would like you guys to ask your neighbor this. Why couldn't they kill him on their own? Why did they have to send him to Pilate? Discuss that. <laughs> For few scripture, which one? 
Someone is saying to fulfill scripture. And you're right, by the way. You're right, because Pilate was a Gentile. And in Psalm 22, it says the dogs are the ones, and the Gentiles were called dogs. So you're right, but I would like to know which scripture. What did your neighbor say? Under Roman law, exactly. So perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, it's not complicated. The Jews at this time were being colonized by the Romans. So although they could recommend someone for death, they didn't have the authority to sentence anyone to death. They could recommend. They needed permission because they were under the Roman law. But that in itself is significant. Do you know why? Because it means that by taking him to Pilate, he had already gotten permission to die from the Jews, from the high priest. So by taking him to Pilate, he was now getting permission to die for the Gentiles. That's why when Jesus came initially, he, didn't, he said, my ministry is only to the Jews. Now this time he was being sent to a Gentile. That's how all of us became included. So he's taken to Pilate. Pilate investigated him and he personally interviewed him. He was curious and he found no guilt to him. Pilate declares Jesus' innocence to his accusers and they protested. Jesus was silent. And then when Pilate learned that Jesus was a Galilean, he sent him to Herod because Herod was the one in charge of that area. And Herod was excited when Jesus came because he wanted Jesus to do a miracle for him. <laughs> so Herod was excited. And he said, okay, do a miracle. Chitako, maybe he brought water. Like, Chitako, nifunako champagne. Maybe he went in the road and got all the lame people. Oh, yeah, like watch, because the guy wanted entertainment. Jesus did nothing. So what does Pilate do? Sends him back in a blue robe. What is that robe representing? Royalty. That's Herod, sorry. So Herod thinks he's mocking Jesus. Can't she's giving him an attire of a king? <laughs> he's now giving him an attire of the king and giving permission for him to die for the Gentiles. And he sends him back to Pilate. Pilate and Jesus had interesting conversations. Jesus was asked, are you? Yes, I am. And, and then Jesus tells Pilate, you wouldn't have any authority except we gave it to you. I've also got a kingdom and where I come from, ABCD. Pilate is like, hey. And then Pilate's wife comes. Pilate's wife came to him. And Pilate's wife comes and goes like, leave that man alone. I suffered the entire night because of him. Meaning in the spiritual realm, they were like, I, I don't know, I think there was just one angel who didn't get the memo. <laughs> and said, no, there's no way. <laughs> but with a party, uh -uh. <laughs> Went and began to mend him. Do you know someone can suffer for your sake? Okay, let me not go into that. No, imagine that. Someone is sitting on something that's supposed to be yours. No, let them stop sleeping. Until they sign it. Let them stop sleeping. Let them start dreaming you're chasing them, saying, sign, sign. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I said glory. <laughs> Have you ever had a situation where someone doesn't know why they're supposed to give something to you, but they just give it to you? Praise God. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's try and finalize. So, um, when the trial reconvenes after he was... Because Pilate, Herod dressed Jesus as a pretend king. He didn't know what he was doing. Sends him back. And then Pilate decides... Okay, look. Pilate decides he wants to do Jesus a favor. So he tells them, okay, fine. Let's have him whipped. That was the favor he was doing Jesus. Like, I'll have him whipped so that these guys are no longer angry. And then, you can go back. And he was whipped 39 plus 1. Now, the way those guys used to whip, it wasn't a belt like this belt. The belt was made, it had like animal teeth. 
So in short, like if you're whipping this guy, you will hit and it will graze out flesh. That's why it says, now, 600 years before, there was a guy, I don't know, people are just seeing the guy is just walking in perfect health. This is my imagination. They're wondering, this guy, what's wrong with him? And then the guy would just talk a certain way. He would just be talking, talking. Then they ask, what's going on? No, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That's 600 years before. Yet we are, we are, we are considered him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was bruised for our iniquities. That's talking about a man 600 years later. And he says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, which stripes? The stripes were the ones that came from the pa. Those were making stripes. At this point, Jesus is no longer looking. Please take a seat. Like in the like sometimes when we when we have photos of Jesus at the cross, I think you know the parts that I I would want to suggest they change. I think he looks too handsome. You do know that when he was, by the time he was reaching the cross, he was looking very ugly. That's what the scripture prophesied, Isaiah 53. It says, he had no beauty that anyone could behold him. How do you think a man can look? They've put out your beard, they've, they've, they've gorged you, they've done this, they've done that. How do you think your face looks? Your face looks disfigured. He just looked like, I don't know, if there's anything like looking like rock bottom, anything like looking like the trash of the earth, that's probably what he looked like at that moment. No, how do you expect a man to look after 39 plus 1 lashes? And after they've put out the beard and you've, you've beaten him up, how do you expect him to look? And then you've given him a... Let's continue. Now, this is the part, as I'm ending, where I want you to consider this the most holy moment because the Lord is doing something. There's a revelation that he's adding to your heart. So I want you to consider this very holy. So then, Peter, Pilate does this. Not knowing that, look, Jesus didn't just want you free from sin. He wanted you free from sickness. So those lashes were for the sicknesses. They were for the sicknesses. And then, the Pilate really wanted to release Jesus. And by this time, a crowd has gathered. And so Pilate comes and says, and remember, Jesus was popular just a week before. So Pilate thinks, let me use the crowd now. And he comes and says, who do you guys want? Jesus or Barabbas? Now think about this. Jesus, who was healing your sick and raising your dead. Barabbas, who, there were people in the audience whose families he had killed. Whose houses he had robbed. And they all started shouting, Barabbas, Barabbas. Eventually, they convinced him because they told him, saying, this man calls himself a king. How will it look? And so, they put a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him. They would hit him and then they would say, who healed you? Who hit you? And then Pilate presents him and says, Behold the man. And the Jews keep demanding for his death. Pilate tried, if you had to read, he tried at least four times to have him released until they told him you'll be an enemy of Caesar. So what Pilate did is he presented him to them to, to crucify, but he said, behold your king. And the Israelites said something interesting which probably didn't help them for the rest of their lives. How many of you remember the Israelites had a very bad period called the Holocaust in history? When Pilate said, this man is not guilty, 
Do you know what the Israelites answered? Can I read you the verse? Let's read it quickly. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. Matthew 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, that's now when a riot reaches a certain level, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Next verse. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. <laughs> and that's why it shouldn't shock you that in the years that followed, a lot of Jewish blood was shed. Okay, let's continue. So the Romans began to lead Jesus towards the place of execution and he was now carrying a cross. Now, it's one thing to carry a heavy cross when you are fit. Now, imagine all the stuff you've just experienced, including emotional anguish, and then they make you carry a cross. So, like, uh, I, I need, like, just a figurative picture, right? So, come through. Charlie, and arts, right? I saw a cross this side. Yeah, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. Is it movable? Run. I want you just to picture this. Wait a manga. Okay. Lovely. So you be the cross guy. And then two people like to be weeping. <laughs> now, I want you to think, come through, come through, come through. Think about this, right? Firstly, I want you to picture it. How do you think Jesus looked? And how do you think his strength levels were by the time he's being given a heavy cross to carry? I've just shown you the anguish he went through. Do you think he's got the strength to carry a cross? So what do you think was happening every after two seconds? Like, give me a picture of it. Now, as funny as it may look, and they're weeping. Iwe. Nyamula iwe. Now. Now. And it's another one. And then, I want you to think about this. Then... A gentleman was coming, and the man was African. Uh, some come. Now, this man didn't volunteer to carry the cross. You would almost think it's like colonization. The guy didn't volunteer to carry the cross. You would almost think you'd almost think as though this gospel was brought to him through colonization. He didn't volunteer. They just grabbed him. And <laughs> forced him to carry it on behalf of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, it may have come through colonization, <laughs> but God had a reason. And I'll tell you something. I believe Africa is now the one carrying the burden of God here on earth. Because we are passionate people. And so eventually, he gets to the cross. We don't know what happened to the African. The African can go away. <laughs> and he gets to Gogotha, right? And then there were also women weeping. There were women weeping. Like, you, can we have the women, like a few women coming to weep? Oh, daddy, my Jesus. Oh, daddy. And then, do you know what Jesus did? He stopped and said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. <laughs> He's like, bye. And someone's like, yeah, bye, papa. <laughs> The Son of God tells you that. Just know it's wild. 
Now, interestingly, the women in Jesus' ministry never ran away. They all remained. At this point, the disciples are gone, except John. The women remained. Ha! Huh. Okay, give the cross back to the Lord Jesus. So he is now on the cross, right? And then, yeah. Can I just read you guys a brief description? Are you guys ready for it? Uh, just give me a second. I want you to hear this. Now, what happens is, they strip him of his clothes, threw them down on a wooden cross, stretched out his hands, and took a spike nail, and then they hammered it to the wrist. Maybe you guys can like hold him so that he's able to do this. Yeah. So they hammer the nail deliberately on the wrist. Deliberately. And then the reason why they hammered it on the wrist... Like, because the weight of his body once lifted on the cross would have torn his hands if it were through the palm. But instead the wrist, because only the spot where the two bones of the wrist come together can support the full weight of a man hung by a spike nail. Yeah. And then the soldiers crossed his feet together and dropped it into a previously dug hole it was probably at this point, according to Psalm 22, verse 14, that maybe all of his bones were not like enjoined, sort of like. And then the way the crucifixion was designed was not so that someone should just die, it was so that someone should die slowly and painfully. And the most painful thing to do when you're on a cross is breathe. Because as you, for you to, ex, to inhale and excel, you're putting yourself through excruciating pain. And that's why it would take hours. Sometimes it would take a whole night for someone to die completely. And then they begin to mock him. And he's next to two thieves. One of them turns... And says, if you are the son of God, why don't you save yourself and save all of us? And the other one says, I rebuke you. Us, we are thieves. This man is innocent. And the man turns and says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And now, probably these, these words were now being said. Remember, to, just to breathe is hard. So for Jesus to talk was excruciating. And he says, today, not tomorrow. That's what I'm <laughs> today, you will be with me in paradise. In short, we're going together. And Jesus' greatest horror is now revealed. For the first time in the scriptures, Jesus doesn't call God Father. He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachani. I said it right. Okay, guys. <laughs> What he said was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's fulfilling Psalm 22. Now, that means that in that moment, God could not look at Jesus. So the peace that comes with God's presence and all those things. Why? Because Jesus was not carrying sins. Jesus became sin. You need to understand this. At the cross, Jesus became everything that God hates. Let me say that again. At the cross, Jesus became everything that God hates. Every filth known to man, Jesus became. That shock on your face when you hear, that person did that. That's what he became. For billions of people at the same time. So if he looked bad in the physical, can you imagine how he looked in the spiritual? And so God turned away. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? <sighs> but in that process, he still had time to say something. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And somehow they, they, they made sure it was written on top. The king of the Jews. And Jesus also had time to ensure his family is in order. He turned to John and said, John, this, is, this one is now your mother. And he told Mary, saying, Mary, this is now your son. So he made sure Mary's affairs are in order. Maybe that's why John was the disciple he loved. Probably John cared more about all the other stuff. And then Jesus, at noon, darkness fell upon the entire land until the ninth hour. Guys, the signs were there. Suddenly it's dark. The sun disappears at noon. And then Jesus says, I thirst. And he was offered a sponge of sour wine and he received it. And he said the words that changed my life forever. You know what he said? It is finished. And he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died. The moment he died, something strange happened. Matthew 27, verse 51. Yeah, you can remain there for pictorial purposes. Since you're a guy, so you're strong. The glory of the young man is his strength. Now look at this. It says, Then behold... The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. That's what I'm saying. The signs were there. Now, I want you to understand that the veil in the temple was so thick that it needed 300 men this side and 300 men that side just to pull it. But then it was torn in two. And in Jewish tradition, what they believed is that if the veil was ever torn, it meant the presence of God had left the temple. It meant Ichabod. And then the earth quaked, like boom. Rocks were split. But here's something else that happened that maybe sometimes we missed out when we're reading the Bible. What happened next? And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And these were not ordinary saints. Do you know how I know? Look at what the next verse says. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they came out after the resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when you look at the context, these guys seemed like they were similar to Jesus. Like they were appearing. So I want you to imagine, you're just walking. And then you just say, Abraham. Hey, Abraham. Uh. You're walking this side, you saw someone who looked like you know, and then you see someone dancing, can't you see David? <laughs> Why do you think when Jesus was being resurrected, he was received into a cloud? Okay, that's a story for another day. There will be another session where we we'll deal with what happened when he died, what happened when he went to hell, what happened when he ascended, who he ascended with. And why now we've come to the spirits of just men made perfect. And perhaps we can also look at where those people used to go before Jesus died. Because there's somewhere they used to go. There's a reason why when Lazarus and the rich man, there's a reason why when Lazarus died, the Bible didn't say he went to heaven. And when you look at the description of the place, it wasn't heaven because you can't see the throne room. You can't see the throne. It was a territory which was being ruled by Abraham. And that territory was not far from hell because they could see each other. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll look at those things very soon. So you guys can take your seats. Then what happened next? The guard, the centurion guard, turned and said, Surely 
this was the son of God. Jesus' followers who were looking on him from a distance along with the women who came with him to the cross were devastated. And they pierced his body to ensure that he's dead. And what happened? Blood and water. And what are, blood and water are emblems of birth. That means although the kennel of wheat was dying, something was being born. Although the only begotten was dying, an entire generation was going to be born. And that's why when Jesus resurrected, he never resurrected as the only begotten. He resurrected as the firstborn. Some of you are tired. Let me end here. Okay, let me read the rest quickly. A rich man came and got permission from Pilate to take Jesus' body from the cross and bury it in a nearby tomb. That's why there are some things that need money and influence. His body was prepared with burial spices laid in a tomb. His tomb was sealed with a large stone and the next day they even asked for guards to be put at the tomb so that the disciples don't steal the body. Jesus' body remained. And then after the Sabbath, the women went to prepare Jesus' body now for burial. And then there they were greeted by angels. And they asked a question that has changed our lives. He say, they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? <laughs> The women. <laughs> and then one of my favorite women in the Bible, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, how she's distressed. And Jesus comes to her and says, Hey, that's Shani. And Mary goes, like, Just tell me. Tell me where they've hidden my Lord. For Mary, he was still her Lord even well dead. And then Jesus said, Mary. <laughs> and Mary replied, Rabboni! <laughs> and then she wanted to touch him. And then he refused. And said, you can't touch me because I've not yet presented the blood before the Father. Why? Remember, he was now the high priest. And what was the high priest supposed to do? High priest was supposed to get blood and go and take it into the presence, into the temple. But remember, the veil has torn, so the presence has shifted. It's no longer the earthly temple. It's now the heavenly one. And then Jesus, who had now taken the position of high priest, could present blood. Which blood? His own. Imagine the lamb presenting his own blood. He was the priest. He was the lamb at the same time. And so he gets the blood. So now he could present it before the Father and say, it's done. It's finished. Now, from now on, Listen, from now on, you don't, you, you don't have to punish Anna. You don't have to punish Cedric. Like, here it is. Like, now and for it's done completely, atoned eternally. Like, they don't have to die for their own sins. I've done it. Now I want to go back and get them. <laughs> no, we need to say that again. He, as the role of the high priest was to get all that blood for the lambs, for the goats, for the what, and take it before the presence of God, and it could atone for them for one year. But Jesus takes his own blood and says, it's settled forever. Fred doesn't have to pay for his own sin. If he can just come under my lordship, that's it. They went and told the disciples. Peter and John decided to go investigate. And John, when John was writing, John was younger than Peter. John said Peter began running, but the younger one outran the older one. And Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days, teaching them the things of the kingdom. He had breakfast with them. He showed Thomas who the boss was. He rebuked their unbelief. And then he told them to come and tell us the message. And today, 
we can experience Jesus unlimited. Can we give the Lord a hand? So, so you know, the only thing I want us to do, uh, we're going to take the communion now, but before that, I want us to do something. Um, one of the best ways you can say thank you is to praise, right? Like, if you, if you, you watch football, if a footballer scores a goal, how do you thank him? Yeah! Now, when you've, I've just given you a picture of what Jesus did. For one minute, can we just say thank you? Hello, I don't want the quiet thank you. I want the celebratory thank you. In a minute. Are you ready? Can I give you a count? Okay. At the count of three, let's go. One, two, three.